Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Gracie, and I run a, a digital consultancy called Flavify Digital. Um, and um, you're signed into a webinar about the General Data Protection Regulation, e-privacy regulations, and the Data Protection Bill, and, and um, what they might mean for your business. Um, thanks for joining. You've got a, access to a control panel. Um, if you've got any questions as we go through, then you can ask a question um, through that control panel, and we'll pick those up towards the end. Um, hopefully, you can see um, the screen, which has got a, um, a blue background with a Union Jack and a European flag on a pole, um, and the title of the webinar. And I'm just going to skip forward to the um, next slide, which is a, a picture of me. Um, and hopefully you can all see that. So uh, any questions, then use the um, question section of the control panel, and I'll pick those up towards the end. So um, as I said, I'm the founder of a, a digital consultancy called Flavify Digital, um, and uh, data protection, privacy, um, and security within businesses is one of the areas that um, I specialize in. Um, and I also run a service called the Digital Compliance Hub, which I'll just talk briefly about that towards, towards the end. Um, my, my background is, is actually in telecoms with a 15-year career in uh, internet regulation, um, both in terms of internal compliance and external stakeholder influencing, uh, in, in, including uh, things like working with the government and, and industry and, and, and other players in, in this area. Um, and I was a data protection officer for a, a number of years um, and first got involved in data protection when the Data Protection Act became a, um, a law in the UK back in 1998. So today we're going to talk about um, three things really, the uh, general data protection regulation, um, the uh, e-privacy regulations and the um, data protection bill, I forgot what it was that the third thing was then, um, all things relating to um, data protection and privacy and particularly relevant if you're involved in marketing because they all impact on uh, on marketing, and I'll talk probably a bit more about that than I do the other areas, but um, those are the three key bits of legislation that are, are going to make data protection and, uh, uh, and privacy and, and, as I say, marketing um, quite an interesting challenge over the next few years for, for various reasons. Um, so hopefully you'll go away at the end of this um, webinar with some uh, idea about what the new laws and rules mean, um, whether you need to worry about them, and if you do, what kind of things you might want to start thinking about in terms of uh, making sure that you're compliant or your, your organisation is compliant, or indeed maybe even um, if you're working with uh, clients of your own, um, how that you might better help them um, prepare for the changes that are coming. So in terms of um, where things sit at the moment um, with data protection and privacy. Um, and those, those are essentially, even though there's three, three things in the um, title, these are the, the, the main core areas um, that, uh, um, that we're going to be talking about, uh, data protection and privacy. Um, so right now we have the Data Protection Act, of course, um, and um, that sets out what uh, we can and can't do with data that um, we collect relating to uh, UK citizens. Um, and sets out the rules and regulations around uh, data protection. Um, and we have the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations, or PECA, which set out the rules relating to privacy, specifically about marketing in a, it, using electronic communications um, and cookies. Um, it covers a few other things, but um, it, in a, uh, the kind of things that we're going to be covering, those are the main things. And what's changing is that we're getting a new EU regulation called the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, as I'll, I'll refer to it probably um, going forward. Um, we're also likely to see at some point, um, in theory, at the same time as GDPR becomes into force, a new e-privacy regulation should come into force as well, which will replace um, our, our PECA and the privacy directive that um, PECA is based on. Um, and then sort of pulling those together is a, a, a bill that was um, announced by the Queen in the Queen's speech probably a month or so ago um, called the Data Protection Bill, um, which um, th there isn't much information about what that actually involves, but um, it, it will probably pull together a number of things um, which, uh, which we'll cover in a, in, in a little detail a bit further on in the presentation. So let's, let's talk about data protection first. Um, so just to, just to clarify, data protection in a, in a general sense, so as implemented by the Data Protection Act and indeed as, as um, 
part of and a key part of the general data protection regulation as, as well is, is all about the processing of personal data. So if you collect, store, process um, uh, data that relates to a living individual, um, then um, data protection rules apply to you. Um, and, they, and the Data Protection Act um, and the GDPR set out um, things like um, what's lawful processing, um, that you're um, only collecting and processing data that you have a, a that is fair, that there's a specific purpose for, that is kept up to date and it's accurate, so you don't keep it for any longer than is necessary. Um, and um, you also, um, it also sets out some rules around what um, the individuals or the data subjects um, are, can be expected to have access to relating to your use of their data. So the most commonly known one is a subject access request, which gives the right to a, a data subject um, to ask um, an, uh, an organization what data they hold on them and, and how they process that data. Um, and then there's other rules around uh, international transfer, which is right at the end of that list, um, which is about how you um, are allowed to uh, control data flows outside of, um, of the EU, in this instance, as it's a, a, an EU-based directive. So what's changing? Well, what's changing is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, and this fan, um, I'm not going to go through all of those because I haven't really got time, um, but um, I, I will focus particularly on consent, which um, ties in with the privacy stuff and, and as I say, um, is a, a particular um, uh, area that uh, is, is changing and that affects uh, marketing. Um, but the GDPR introduces a number of changes. Um, it's not too far off what we have in the UK as a Data Protection Act. Um, the, the main difference um, is that it's a regulation and it's an EU regulation which means that, um, so in, in EU law there's directives and regulations um, directives are a set of rules which have to be implemented in member state law a regulation is a, a, is a set of rules which um, is uh, automatically applied to the whole of um, the European Union um, and if you're sat there thinking well, we're leaving Europe um, I'm afraid this is coming in next year, 25th of May 2018 um, so there'll be probably at least a year overlap between um, the GDPR and when we leave Europe. So it will apply and then going forward um, we expect um, our data protection rules will need to be adequate to, to continue carrying on processing data of, of our clients and, and customers that may be um, spread out across Europe as well. So um, if you come across anybody who thinks they don't need to worry about this because we're leaving Europe, you, you need to point them in the right direction and say actually that's not the case. This, this is, is, is here and it's, it's probably here to stay even post um, Brexit. So as I say this fan sort of covers the main 10 changes um, I'll quickly go through all of those um, but with a uh, I've got an extra slide on, on consent which I'll come back to. Um, so scope wise um, there's a number of things as I said it's a regulation so it covers the whole of Europe under some circumstances it even covers uh, um, processors um, and controllers who are outside um, the European Union if they're processing certain types of data relating to EU citizens. Um, and, and just to clarify, there's essentially three key definitions here. There's the data subject, which is the person whose data it is that you, you may have, the data controller, who is the person who's collecting or processing that data, and a data processor, who in some circumstances is also the controller, but maybe a, a separate organization who are doing processing. Um, and one of the changes of the GDPR is that the processors have responsibilities under the regulation, which they don't have under the under the act it's all down to the controller under the act but it's actually the controller and the processor has um, certain responsibilities um, so uh, a change in scope um, a slight change in definition um, there's uh, the addition of um, online identifiers so things like IP addresses and um, uh, maybe online handles and, and uh, other ID tags that are used in, in online environments are, are now without if there was any doubt anyway um, um, included in the definition of a personal data. Um, services and, and data collected around children has got a, a special mention. Um, if you run a service um, or have a product where you collect data um, that is likely to be children's data, um, which means you may need to uh, implement some kind of age verification to work out whether the new rules apply, to apply in, in each circumstance or not, um, then you need to, to do a couple of things. One is you need to make sure that any statements about what data you're collecting and what you're using it for are written in child-friendly forms, which personally I think that's not a bad thing for most uh, people, whether they're children or not. 
um, and there's also a need to, um, if they are a child, um, seek parental or guardian consent to the processing of the data. And, and there's a specific carve out in the regulation aimed at, at that particular element um, of the regulation. So um, that's uh, something that's very specific to, to children. Consent, as I said, I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. Um, individuals' rights, they're exactly the same as they are. Um, so subject access requests are still with us. Um, but it's introduced a couple of new um, rights. The, the right to be forgotten, which is uh, a, a right um, to enable a data subject to say to a controller that they have no need to have their data, um, so they'd like it all deleted. Um, obviously, um, that doesn't mean that uh, data subjects have a right to tell you to delete their billing information so that you can't bill for a service, but um, you do have to pay attention to uh, notices of um, people that you might have data on who have asked maybe opted out of mailing and uh, sorry marketing um, or are no longer customers and they have a right if you don't have a lawful reason to keep the information um, to have all their information deleted um, and um, a ch certainly a challenge for people who process lots of data the uh, an additional right of um, portability which basically requires the data controller to provide functionality to allow the export of data held on a data subject into a format that is uh, usable in, in other systems. So uh, I think most people will think, oh, that's to enable a user to move from one service to a competitor's service, but um, equally it might be because the user wants to process that data themselves within their own systems. Um, so in some circumstances, a, a um, a CSV file or, or something that works in, in Excel might be adequate, but um, expect to see all kinds of information standards um, cropping up which uh, enable um, system migration from one system to another, um, which will need to be uh, implemented from a portability point of view. And certainly large processes of data, you're going to expect to have to implement some remote system that enables people to securely log in and access their data, which you, you might already have anyway. Um, and then uh, click a button to uh, export that data into a, a, a format of their choice. Um, one of the buzzwords, and uh, moving on to document, one of the buzzwords around uh, GDPR is really accountability, and that's proving that, uh, that it's, it's the proof on the controller or the processor that they're acting lawfully, um, and um, under some circumstances, um, there's a need to be able to define how you process personal data and what systems are in place for the, that processing. So um, that's for when, uh, if there's an investigation, you are able to demonstrate how those, um, uh, that, that processing is, is being carried out. Um, and, and, and consent also has a requirement for recording um, as well. So uh, it's worth paying attention to the elements of the GDPR that might require you to actually do much more recording of your, your processing activities and, and the purposes for which you're processing. Um, so that you have that as, a, as an evidence base and, and, you, and you're able to demonstrate you're, you're accountable to how you're using the data. Moving on to by design, um, under the Data Protection Act there's no particular law relating to this but um, it's been best practice for, for some time and, and the Information Commissioner has been uh, encouraging people to have data protection or privacy by design um, and use privacy impact assessments that, that both basically work in tandem to ensure that any new service or system or, or process that you might be uh, looking at takes into consideration the privacy um, uh, rules and, and the privacy of the users of that, that, that service or that, that system. Um, under, the data, um, sorry, under the GDPR, um, we've got data protection impact assessments as opposed to privacy impact assessments. Um, and data protection by design, which are exactly the same principles. So if you're looking at processes and, and, uh, or new systems and new services, you need to make sure if they uh, involve the use of uh, personal data, then that you have considered all ramifications of privacy. So you know, if you've got a, a person responsible for data protection, they're more likely now to need to be involved in, in project management teams and, uh, and, and meetings to uh, ensure you're, you're compliant going forward which um, moves us on to people responsible for data protection. Um, data protection officers, there's a, 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 um, a specific classification of um, uh, an individual within an organization defined as a data protection officer who is, um, for some types of business, typically those who process lots of um, data or where data is a, um, personal data is a, a key element of the business. Um, 
they will have to have a data protection officer and that's somebody who can work unfettered within the business um, and allowed to get on and do um, their compliance roles uh, relating to data protection and, and the idea is that, um, that there's some guidance about this as well but um, the idea is that the data protection officer is a, a, a empowered to uh, in, enforce and uh, make sure that there is data protection compliance within an organization Probably most businesses won't need to have one, but they might opt to use the principles as a, as a, as a way forward to ensure ongoing compliance. And depending on the size of your business, as, as I say, I'm, I was a data protection officer, but not in, a, in, a, um, uh, in, in the sense of as defined in, in law, but I was a, a person responsible for data protection compliance. Um, so I suspect we might see more businesses having somebody not necessarily a full-time employee or employee or even an employee because um, even um, people who are required by law to have a data protection officer will will have the option of um, outsourcing it to somebody external um, but I think we'll see more people saying that they're responsible for data protection within businesses um, and then the last two uh, are, are usually the things that, uh, that are used to sort of wake people up to what's going on breaches in some regulated fields um, breaches are already um, things that have to be reported to a regulator and, and possibly the data subjects but the GDPR introduces the concept across the board um, so uh, under certain circumstances if there's a chance that data has been leaked or been accessed unlawfully and it has um, the outcome of that could be harmful to the data subjects then there's a good chance you'll need to report it to the regulator which in our case is currently and probably likely still to be the information commissioner's office um, and uh, you possibly need to tell the data subject as well so they can take action um, to make sure that they mitigate any risk from, from the, the uh, release of that data in the public domain. Um, and then the real, the real stick that lots of people are, are talking about is, is the fines. Um, under the data protection rules at the moment in the UK, the Information Commissioner can fine up to um, uh, half a million. Um, the TalkTalk Talk breach from a couple of years ago, um, or maybe it was last year, um, got uh, 400 they got fined 400k most fines uh, tend to be sort of under a uh, 100k um, but under the GDPR the fines can be um, and there's a couple of levels depending on the type of um, problem that's being fined um, the fines can be up to 4% of global turnover or 20 million euros whichever is the, the largest um, it doesn't mean that the information commissioner will go straight to that top um, level of fine but um, they would use some uh, sort of proportionality measures to uh, determine how they find people but it's an indication that there's uh, a real focus on if you get this wrong it could be a significant portion of your um, your, your business um, uh, turnover that that could be fined and um, it doesn't matter how big you are four percent of global turnover is um, is, is quite a it could be a, quite a significant chunk so that's a very fast overview of um, GDPR and obviously if you need any more help in that then um, I've got some other workshops about more more general going into those in a bit more detail but generally speaking um, those are the main 10 chain changes that are coming and as I said I, I'll just talk very briefly about um, consent which is a very significant change um, particularly for, for marketing people so um, the rules for the GDPR um, are that the messaging has to be clear and um, and, and, and open so you need to be very clear about who you are what you're collecting the data for what it's going to be used for and the subject has to take a positive action to opt into the use of their data in that way so in a marketing environment what this really means is that um, we won't be able to use the uh, pre-ticked marketing boxes or the um, slightly weird worded um, phrases which um, you hope that somebody doesn't spot that they're supposed to untick a box um, and, and those kind of things that they won't be allowed anymore. It has to be a very clear message with a very clear and positive opt-in by the um, data subject. So they have to take an affirmative action to, to opt-in. So no sort of presupposing that they, they'll um, opt out if they don't want it in the future. Um, or that um, you've got a, if you've got pre-tick boxes saying untick this box not to be marketed to, then you're not going to be able to use those going forward. Um, you also can't use consent, consent as, a, um, as, a, as a hook to uh, say, well, you can't have a service unless you consent to um, it being used, your data being processed in this particular way. Um, and you need to be clear about who you're sharing data with, how you can withdraw consent, um, and you need to record 
all of the process that was involved. So you need to understand that a person um, consented at a particular time for a particular purpose or a particular set of purposes. Um, and uh, if you have a question, then you've got that um, to hand. To, uh, as I say, accountability is one of the key areas of GDPR. Um, and the recording is, is, is you, you demonstrating your accountability for um, somebody consenting to the use of their data in a particular way. Um, this also has ramifications going forward for, for legacy data. So again, in a marketing scenario, you may have a large email list. Um, if you can't demonstrate that those emails were collected through a particular process, which is GDPR compliance, then you're going to have to look at that data and decide what you want to do about it. And there's some, I'm hearing some rash stories of people deleting data and starting again. But actually, I think rather than this be sort of seen as a negative thing, think about it as a positive opportunity to look at what marketing data you're using and seeing whether there's a, a, um, some data that you can pull out of that, which is probably better targeted um, than, than sort of random data that people might object to, to going forward. Um, and so there may be an auditing piece of work that you might have to do to look at what data you have right now is it GDPR compliant and how do we go about making sure that it is going forward? Um, and uh, just a word of warning, um, if you've got a, 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 um, a, a deposit of lots of uh, user data at the moment and you've never kind of marketed to them, um, then using email to market to them and asking for the consent going forward is, is not necessarily the right way of doing it. And, and uh, if you look at the Honda case where they were fined um, recently, uh, because they uh, contacted a load of people seeking uh, ongoing consent, um, but the information commissioner said that those people didn't expect those kind of messages, um, and therefore they were in breach of the uh, marketing rules, um, which is um, because they didn't have proper consent in the first place to email market to them. So it's not necessarily um, bad news, but it's um, some things that need to be thought about. So uh, that's consent. So let's move on to um, privacy. As I said, in the UK, we have the um, uh, Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations, um, or PECA, as they tend to be called. Um, we kind of set out three main things there, which um, uh, I show on that slide. Um, rules around marketing, electronic marketing specifically, so that's telephone, email, texts, and if you still use them, faxes. Um, rules around cookies, which is probably what it's most famous for. Um, the cookie consent and what you put on your website and how you manage that and, and, and what is generally a, a confusing uh, approach. Um, and um, some rules around uh, people who run communication services or electronic communication services, particularly around the security of those services, the protection of privacy um, from the use of those services. Um, so from a, a marketing point of view, these uh, rules and regulations don't um, overrule, they complement data protection. Um, they just set out some, some rules that are, are specific um, for, for marketing and the use of cookies. Um, and, and what's interesting, particularly on the marketing side, is that these are the rules that guide us in the way that we market to business data. So under some circumstances, business data can be considered uh, personal data, um, but the uh, regulations set out um, what you can and can't do with regards to marketing to businesses. Um, so even if you're in a B2B, it's worth um, uh, paying attention to these regulations um, and actually what, what's going to be coming along uh, in the form of um, the new set of regulations uh, because there are specific rules about even marketing to businesses. So what, uh, sorry that slide's um, got the wrong name on it, should be privacy, what's changing, not data protection. Um, so what's moving, uh, what's changing with the uh, privacy regulations? Well there's a new EU e-privacy regulation, note it's a regulation not a directive, um, so that will replace the UK's uh, PECA regulation um, and um, the, uh, the interesting challenge is that um, it's still a draft um, but the EU would like it to come into force exactly the same time as GDPR. It would make sense that it comes into force at that particular time um, because there, as I said, uh, privacy and, and data, particularly in some areas around consent, for example, are, are um, sort of overlap and, and, and they complement each other. So it would make sense, but it surely is a challenge for, for the Europe, uh, European parliamentarians and, and the council to be able to work through this draft and, and, and get it through. Um, in terms of um, what's changing, 
there's some scopes, there's a few additional things to consider that um, when the original the privacy directive was uh, drafted, um, things like messenger services like WhatsApp and Snapchat and all those kind um, didn't really exist and weren't being used at the, to the level that they are right now so that the, um, the EU want to make sure that those kind of controls that are in place with other electronic communication services like um, email uh, and internet access uh, um, have the same kind of rules and restrictions and, and consider the privacy of the people using those. Um, as I said, the other scope thing is it's a regulation, not a directive, so it applies across the whole of Europe, so it unifies the European approach to privacy. Um, we're going to see some new rules around cookies, which should hopefully simplify them. They certainly talk about the simplification of cookie rules. Um, so uh, we will need to look out and see what that actually means, but it's probably likely that cookie control will be managed by the browser rather than um, uh, the user having to understand what a cookie notice means on a, on a website and whether they can and can't use cookies if they want to carry on using the website and, and what the website needs to do in terms of complying with the, with the rules. So um, that's one particular area that I think is going to change and probably for, for the good, um, given that uh, cookies, uh, ten, cookies and website notices seems to be a bit of a, a, a sort of a mess in terms of interpretation. Um, and I suspect that in, uh, interpretation across the EU and member states is probably um, varies from state to state. Um, the consent rules for privacy and uh, the privacy regulations will tie in with the consent rules relating to the GDPR going forward. So um, all of the rules around consent will, will apply that sit in GDPR right now. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, we're not sure about, but it looks like it's probably going to be okay, is that um, there was a, a leaked version of the privacy regulation before Christmas that implied that um, business data would be considered the same as pri um, private or personal data and therefore consent rules would completely change for, for business data. But those rules have now been removed and in the current draft it looks as though it will be down to the member states to decide how consent um, and uh, electronic marketing work hand in hand when it's business to business data. So we may see some changes that um, the UK might choose to implement um, in that area or um, things will stay as they are um, today in a B2B environment but from a B2C environment um, there's going to be no change other than the consent rules of GDPR will apply to the privacy regulations going forward. Um, and also the other uh, GDPR linked thing is that the uh, breaches for privacy um, uh, infringements under the regulation um, will tie in with the fines of the GDPR as well. So uh, um, again, significant uh, increase in, in the potential fines that you might get for an um, infringement of the rules. Which leads us neatly onto the Data Protection Bill. Um, <laughs> this is, um, I tend to avoid text heavy slides and I failed on this particular one but on purpose because this is essentially all that we know about what the data protection bill might be and it's a, a cut and paste job from the, um, the background notes for the Queen's speech from a few weeks ago. Um, the uh, Tories said in their manifesto that they were going to introduce new rights for uh, individuals to uh, require social media platforms to delete their data from um, after the age of 18. Um, and um, so that that's one of the things that we expect to see in the bill, and you'll see that on the um, on the, on one of the bullets there on that slide. Um, but generally speaking, we don't really know what's going to be in the bill, other than uh, mention that it's probably going to implement the GDPR in, in UK law, but not that we need necessarily a law to do that because it's a European regulation that applies across the whole of the UK. Um, but there are a few things that we might see in there. Um, uh, particularly around access to data in a um, from a police and security services uh, perspective and there's certainly a directive in that area that um, takes away some of the uh, controls from the GDPR and puts them into a separate directive around how, how do um, law enforcement and, and law enforcement agencies across Europe get access to data um, uh, whilst being compliant with um, the data protection rules. So what, what can we see? As I say, I mean, this is 
this is a, a, certainly a lot of speculation. There's not much to work on there in terms of detail, and, and we're still not sure what um, we can expect. Uh, there's a paper that was published by the House of Lords recently looking at um, the implementation of the GDPR and Brexit and what the ramifications for that are, and, and, th and they've really sort of brought to question that there isn't enough detail in any of um, what's going to happen with, with uh, Brexit. So maybe Brexit's one of the things that might be um, sort of covered off in the bill in terms of uh, how data protection fits in going through uh, after we leave Europe. But um, as I say, based on that previous text, social media rules, access to data by the police and law enforcement agencies are probably going to be a key part, as is implementation of GDPR. Um, but I think one of the key things we're probably going to see in the bill are some derogations. Now, what that means is that in, in any European law, there are certain things which the uh, EU leave to member states to implement. Um, I mentioned one under the privacy rules relating to business-to-business uh, -business marketing. Um, another example is um, around access to data by law enforcement. Um, and also, if you remember when I was talking about the GDPR, I was talking about children's data. Well, um, a child's defined as 16 or under in, in the regulation, but um, there is an opportunity for member states to um, change that down to uh, uh, as low as 13 if the member state wishes to define it so. So um, I very much suspect that over the next um, few months we'll get to know a little bit more about um, the bill and what's going to be in it and how it might look and, and um, it's another area I'm afraid that we'll all need to be careful of in, in terms of making sure that um, we're on top of what it means particularly for data protection compliance under GDPR and also the privacy rules under, under an, a potentially new e-privacy regulation at the same time. So that was a, a very whistle-stop tour of GDPR, e-privacy regulations and the data protection bill. What do you need to do and what should you be thinking about? Well, from a data protection point of view, I think going forward if you've not already started thinking about what you're doing um, with your data and, and how the GDPR may impact your organization, then you need to think about carrying out an audit and, and building a, 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 essentially a register of your data, your system and your policies um, and processes and, and make sure that you're going to meet the 25th of May um, of 2018 uh, deadline. Obviously how much time that will take you will depend on the kind of data you collect and, and, and the size of your business. Um, but uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, some uh, consultants have been pushing the concept of uh, you're running out of time now because it's less than a year, but I, I think um, it really does depend business to business what kind of activities you need. But essentially, it's a case of looking at what you've got right now, how does it factor with the GDPR, getting a plan in place to deliver that compliance in time. Um, and, and then the ongoing thing, which is the third bullet in that blue box, is managing your ongoing compliance. Uh, data protection compliance isn't, isn't a, a box ticking exercise where you do it once and you don't have to worry about it ever again. There's a, a whole host of things that you need to think about. You need to make sure your, your policies and processes are up to date and everything is uh, in, in line with compliance. We're going to see some changes probably with what Brexit might mean, what the data protection bill might mean, what the regulation and how it's interpreted across member states, um, even our own ICO's interpretation. Um, the European level interpretation, um, so what's currently the Article 29 Working Party, um, they're all producing guidance and, and uh, views on, on how different elements of the regulation will be interpreted. So this isn't a, a, a one-off thing, this is something you need to keep a, a, a watching eye on. Um, and you need to make sure your staff are up to date as well so that they understand what their duties are and, and what's changing and how that impacts on their, on their role within your business. And um, privacy is not too too dissimilar, more of interest to marketing teams, but again, it's about what, what are the changes, you know, keeping an eye on whether the business to business marketing rules change in the UK and what that might mean for a business, but um, it's understanding what data you're using, how you're using it and, and managing in the same way with data protection, your ongoing compliance. And as I say, with that green arrow at the bottom, um, we need to keep an eye on what's happening with the GDPR and interpretations going forward. Um, or even um, case presidents and things like that, um, what's happening with e-privacy and the data protection bill, and also with Brexit. Um, I suspect that um, we will be awash with uh, commentary and, and views and discussions about what Brexit means with, with European law and how that fits into the UK, but the current plan is to a piece of legislation that 
basically encapsulates into UK law at the point of Brexit all UK law as it is at that point. So that will include all European law and then it will all be worked out afterwards. But I, I certainly in terms of data protection and privacy, I very much doubt that anything's going to change. So if, if you if you or somebody you know is relying on the fact that it's changing in a in uh, 2018, uh, sorry, 2019, if it, things go ahead as planned for the government, then um, I'm afraid I think you're going to be um, very disappointed. So um, this sort of summarises pretty much what, what I've said in terms of looking forward. We've got the GDPR um, and preparing yourself for, for the GDPR, what the e-privacy might um, mean both potentially the e-privacy and GDPR coming into force on the 25th of May 2018. GDPR definitely, e-privacy depends on, on how it goes through um, the various uh, checks and balances within the EU that it needs to jump through, um, so the hoops it has to jump through. And um, we've got a data protection bill to look out for. And then the rest of it is about, you know, what might happen with Brexit, what might happen with in terms of you know, case law and interpretation from, from courts, but from regulators how that impacts on what's happening in the UK, if it's regulators outside the UK within the EU, um, and, and actually the UK's own action in terms of what the Information Commissioner, so the ICO Information Commissioner's Office is the regulator that's responsible for upholding data and privacy laws. Um, they've got guidance coming out, so there's supposed to be guidance at any time now about consent, for example, but there's a whole host of other bits of guidance and they're asking questions for people's input on, on certain other aspects of GDPR implementation. But um, if you don't already follow what the ICO do in terms of taking action, it's worth paying attention to that because there's been a lot of action recently. Um, uh, Money Supermarket just been fined 80k for um, uh, mass ma email marketing to people who had opted out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Honda got fined, uh, I think it was either 10 or 50,000 for um, email marketing people they shouldn't have email marketed in the first place. There's a load of work. Um, a load of activity around charities and their, and their supposed unlawful processing of uh, data for the purposes of profiling potential donors. There's a whole raft of information, even down to small businesses who run online websites that got hacked and data got leaked. Um, you know, they're, they're finding quite a lot of people at the moment. Um, and there's a, a view that actually they're taking on quite a lot of people in their enforcement teams. Um, not entirely clear why and they might be doing that other than to keep on top of, of, of issues that are being raised with them but um, you know potentially you could argue what do the general public how are they going to act um, or react to the GDPR coming into force on the 25th of May and um, are they going to be uh, empowered and knowledgeable enough that they might want to take uh, it, it a bit more seriously and start asking questions and uh, we might see a, a raft of or a flurry of um, actions and investigations from the, from the ICO. So quite a lot to keep on top of and to think about, um, let alone trying to work out what you're doing with GDPR right now and, and how that might factor in um, to your business and, and your processes, but also um, you know keeping on top of changes in that area, particularly in terms of interpretation from guidance and, and, and the like. So um, a very quick sales message. Um, this is where I can come in and, and where my business can help. As I said, Flavify Digital is a digital consultancy. One of the services that we offer is the Digital Compliance Hub. This is an, uh, a chance for you to manage your own compliance, and it covers data protection, privacy, and marketing compliance, as well as uh, uh, approaches to web and data security, um, workshops and training. Um, it's an online subscription-based service that provides information, guidance, and advice, and an element of it is actually access to real people um, uh, so you can quiz me about um, your GDPR challenges or, or any particular questions you might have, um, and that's via email or, or phone support. Um, and if you sign up now, there's a free month uh, uh, trial that you can uh, get access to. So uh, if you could have a look around and see what you think and see whether it's something that can help you. And as I say, there's uh, help and support when you need it there as well. Um, if you want something very specific or project-led, then um, the consultancy um, side of my business um, can deliver compliance audits, um, the management of compliance, the training, getting your staff up to up to scratch, um, or even specific consultancy goals if you um, need a couple of hours of time or somebody just to flesh out some of the concerns and how they might impact on your products or your business. 
um, then uh, we have consultancy packages to help with that. And as I said, underlying all of that and sort of covering the whole piece from a sort of self-service point of view is a digital compliance hub. So there's quite a few ways that we can help you um, with uh, meeting your compliance needs, be it privacy, marketing, compliance, or, or um, most pressing the uh, GDPR right now. So as I catch my breath, we can, um, we've got a few minutes left for um, some questions. So let me just have a look. Um, somebody's asking, how can they stop the background music? And um, Peter, I'm really sorry if you can hear background music. I, I'm hoping that you can hear me, but uh, if, if not, um, I'll be dropping an email round so that you can have a look and uh, at uh, hopefully a recording, uh, provided the recording's worked. Um, but uh, if everybody's been listening to background music, then um, I'm probably talking to myself right now. Um, so now's the chance to ask some questions. Have you got any questions? Um, ah, so Peter just said it's all sorted. Has anybody got any questions? If they can use the questions um, section in the uh, control panel, you should see on your screen, then um, I can uh, try and answer those for you. Um, if not, then um, that's we've reached the end. So I'll just give a few minutes for people to, to fill in. Um, any questions they might have? Okay, so no, nothing's coming through right now. Um, I hope you found that useful. If there's anything that um, uh, um, so actually, just as I'm talking, somebody's come in. Thanks for that question, um, Cameron. Um, wondering if the May 2018 is a hard deadline. I'm afraid it is. Um, it's actually in the regulation for, for the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, it says it's two years from the publication of the uh, final version, which happened, uh, well, it's actually a number of uh, days past the publication, but essentially 25th of May 2018, it's all compliant uh, from that point on. So there, there is no flexibility. And if anybody's telling you you've got a bit more time past 25th of May 2018 um, to get yourself compliant, then I'm afraid they're not telling you the truth. Um, you've got no choice. That's that's the deadline. It's hard and fixed. The only thing that we're not sure about is whether the privacy regulations, which they want to roll out at the same time, will meet that deadline. And that's more of a process thing. Um, but uh, as far as GDPR is concerned, 25th of May 2018, is the day when it takes over from the UK's Data Protection Act and therefore is uh, 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 that's the date you've got to um, aim for, I'm afraid. So uh, Sylvia's asking a question about what's the minimum number of employees you have to have um, to um, require having a data protection officer. Um, so the, the the regulation and the uh, and some of the notes and comments about uh, the GDPR sort of talks about 250 plus. But if you have a business that's probably less than that, but your primary business function is processing personal data, then there's a good chance that you will need to have a data protection officer. Um, and some uh, people have no choice. They uh, so public bodies bodies, for example, have to have a data protection officer. Um, in place, but um, if you're looking for a number, it's uh, 250 plus, but I, I think it's a bit more complex than that. Um, there is an Article 29 Working Party um, guidance document that uh, sets out its its belief and interpretations about who does need a data protection officer, but I'm not sure that it goes into enough detail that will be much more, <laughs> giving you much more information than, 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 than that. Okay, a few more questions coming in. Uh, right. Um, So uh, I've got a question about uh, software companies um, who are developing their software. Are there ways to show plans of development to incorporate incorporate uh, GDPR, um, certainly from a, a roadmap perspective? Um, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, apologies, Cameron. I'm not sure I totally understand the question. But if if, if you if you provide software in the cloud, um, and your question is about how does GDPR factor into that? Well, as a processor, a, a cloud provider is going to be seen as a processor if you enable um, your clients to process personal data, and therefore 
um, there are some specific rules, mainly to enable your clients to be able to um, deliver their own compliance, um, and uh, you will need to have certain things. So if the client has a requirement to provide data portability, which is a rule under GDPR, then, then you'll need to have that functionality um, to enable them to, to do that. Um, and it may have to keep up with um, industry standards or industry formats, depending on what uh, sort of industry bodies and other certified uh, organizations might uh, require. Um, in terms of how you factor GDPR into your software development, well, under the GDPR, you have a, a requirement for data protection impact assessment. So that's looking at how you, uh, what your product or your service might mean for the privacy and data protection of the data subjects. Um, and you have this principle of data protection by design. So you will have to ensure that data protection is a key part of that. So it's not so much of where that might fit in, in, in your plan or in your roadmap. It has to be a, a central part of what you're trying to achieve with your software. So I, I, um, I hope that's answered your question. But um, feel free um, to uh, ping me an email if, uh, if I've not answered it that um, your specific uh, thoughts on that. Uh, right, so um, Louise has asked a good question. Is there a guideline um, on the length of time a person's marketing consent lasts for? Um, there, there isn't really anything sort of hard and fast, but certainly some of the guidance, um, there's a draft guidance from the Information Commissioner about uh, GDPR consent and, um, and a few other uh, pieces of advice and guidance I've seen which talk about whether um, you should have your own processes about whether you renew consent every six months or 12 months and, and that would vary according to your um, business. I, th I think there, the approach really to take is what's a reasonable time for your own business in terms of marketing uh, information to, to understand whether you've got a list of people who are engaging with your marketing or not and um, maybe then's a chance for you to, to clear out um, data that's not really working for, for you. Um, but uh, there, there aren't any hard and fast rules. I think it will be on a business to by business basis, but you should really be thinking of reviewing your consent on a, on a regular basis, probably annually or, or maybe slightly longer for that. And I think if you can demonstrate um, that you've done that um, to the information commission, should they ask, then I think that will stand you in good stead as, as, as well. Um, so a question from Robert, just following on from that last point really about um, cleaning out old data and, and is there, um, what are the options for making an existing database compliant uh, if, you, if you're not able to email them? Well, I mean, if, you, if you've got, a, a say, an email list and you regularly email those people and they've come to expect you to be sending them marketing emails in the hope that they've opted into that, um, then you could argue that they would expect further marketing emails from you, which you can use email marketing to say, look, we've got these new rules coming in. We want to be sure that you're opting in to um, what you believe you're going to receive through, through this email list. Um, and you'd be able to carry on email marketing that particular concept. That The Honda example I used earlier, the problem they had is they collected a load of emails from showrooms where people have sort of perhaps asked for copies of um, brochures about cars. Um, and they use that data to say, well, actually, you know, we would like to market to you as well. Can you consent? And, and the information commissioner said that uh, asking for consent is a form of marketing, given that that was the end game. And uh, therefore, that was unlawful processing um, without consent. If you do have a load of data and you really don't use it as marketing and you or you can't prove that these people have opted in and consented to that marketing, there are other ways of doing it. Um, the, uh, the most obvious one, and, and possibly the, the, the easiest one, is um, using postal, <laughs> uh, using snail mail and old formed written letters because uh, provided um, you have uh, just cleaned them against the mail preference service so that people have uh, said they don't want to receive marketing messages through um, mail, then um, they, um, sh you shouldn't be sending them letters either. But um, other than that, you can um, you can send written uh, marketing materials without uh, any any concerns about um, whether people have opted in or not. Um, so the answer to your question is really, 
if they, if they are used to receiving marketing information from you, then you'll be able to carry on using the same medium. Um, you just need to make sure that uh, you can't assume, you can't use statements like, we'll assume you're okay if we don't hear from you. It's got to be, you know, click on this page to go to a website to sign up and you build up a new list of consent. Otherwise, it's starting from scratch um, as, a, as a possible uh, easier option. Okay, we've got time for just one more question. Um, so, uh, just following up on the question about um, whether May 2018 was a, was a strict deadline, um, the, the follow-up to that question was um, what might happen if, that, if you don't meet that date. Well, I mean, essentially it's a risk management exercise. Um, any, any date of GDPR consultant is going to tell you you need to be compliant by that date. Um, it's up to your organization's appetite for the risk of being found out that they're not. So, um, if you don't meet that date, you're going to have to demonstrate why you've not done that and, and lack of time uh, to prepare is probably not going to be a sensible answer. Um, so um, there, there really isn't much you can do about that. You need to comply by the 25th of May 2018 um, um, or you're going to have to hope that nobody finds out that you're not compliant and, uh, and you don't get an information commissioner letter or, or an investigation looking at your policies, processes and data and your approach to uh, data protection to see that you're not compliant. Okay, uh, a question from Peter, do text, automatic text messages fall into GDPR? Yes, well, they, they do in the sense that um, using text messaging for the purposes of, uh, of marketing are covered by the privacy rules, so PECA at the moment and the privacy regulations will cover that as well. Um, so there are strict rules around using um, SMS text-based messaging um, for marketing and therefore, uh, yes, uh, under GDPR that means consent will be uh, a relevant uh, test. Um, but uh, so. Any marketing, doesn't matter what, which format, um, uh, with the exception of you know, postal marketing, um, you need uh, consent um, and uh, certainly if it's an electronic means, you, you need to worry about the privacy regulations as well as, as the GDPR. Okay, that's, that's great. There's um, certainly a, a sudden rush of questions, which was, which was brilliant. Um, that's taken us up to almost the hour which um, I'd scheduled for this uh, webinar. So thank you very much for, for joining me. If um, there's anything I can help you with, then let me know. Um, and that can be, you know, if you want to look around the Digital Compliance Hub um, and I've we'll got some questions, then, uh, you know, we can talk about that. Or if you want to um, do some one-off pieces of consultancy, then obviously be in touch. Um, other than that, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you found it useful um, and maybe speak again soon. Thanks.